Welcome to Total Agent Access, where we interview the most inspiring real estate agents in the world to share with you the best advice from our brightest minds. With your host, me, Colin Bredner. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I am with Natalie Davison, and it's without the second D, she tells me. I always yeah. want to say David's son, David son, but yeah. Well, well here where I'm from, people also want to put an H in Natalie. So it's, I'm always like Natalie with no H, Davidson with no second D. Yeah. I'm always calling with one L. <laughs> there you go. You know, no, not with two L. So <laughs> we were uh, just discussing um, some fun stuff about being a veteran real estate agent. Uh, Natalie without an H is uh going into your 20th year 20th year since i was licensed there was a brief hiatus for uh with no licensing for a little period there in the middle that we can discuss but yeah i got my <laughs> license almost 20 years ago and that was in the gta so my office was in mississauga just outside of toronto oh, okay so that's where you sort of started your career but you are from moncton yes. did you grow up in moncton i grew up in moncton my husband grew up in toronto Okay. And so we spent 10 years there and then we moved back here. And how did you get them back? How did I get them back here? Yeah. Um, the housing prices. <laughs> like that, I mean, like, which is like really wild when you think, you know, you're a realtor. But um, listen, we sold our house in Burlington, Ontario, almost on the lake. In not like not almost on the lake, but like right near the lake. We were not on the lake, but close to Lakeshore in 2010 for 389 and we thought we were rich <laughs> like it's never gonna get better than this <laughs> no no and you know what i i tell the story I, you know in my town of prince george when i first got licensed the average house was uh 220,000, and the real you know newer homes were like 300 to 350 and right. I thought at that time, I'm like, holy smokes, that's a lot of money. I can remember moving up from my starter home to, a, you know, what I figure is a really nice home. And I spent 360 and it almost killed me. Well, our first house we bought in Oakville, Ontario. It's a suburb of Toronto. And our first house was 199 and in Oakville. And, you know, you think back to those times. I mean, and, and even that, like our neighbors in Burlington, when we, when we really like, robbed the bank and sold for 389 our neighbors across the street were original owners so they had built their house for sixteen thousand dollars and they sold uh, a couple years ago for over 2.2 million and you know you just see what <laughs> we haven't seen those kinds right of appreciations there. in Moncton New Brunswick um, but yeah. you know when you look at real estate values across the country it's really interesting to watch what's happened and so Moncton has been going through a really interesting moment since the pandemic uh, because our prices have been kind of historically undervalued, in my opinion. And so we've been going through this moment and I say all the time, I'm like, you know, don't worry, I've done this before. I was a realtor in the GTA in the early 2000s and uh, I bought my first house there for $199, right? So it's not my first rodeo in this in this type of a market, but it is really interesting to watch people experience it for the first time. Yeah, that. You know, your neighbors there selling for what's 3.2 or whatever is just, that's why you buy real estate, right? So. Yeah. And like, little did they know in the, you know, in the sixties when they bought, built that house, right? Like little did they know that they, they would have never dreamed. I mean, a hundred thousand dollar house back then would have been a mansion, right? Like yep. they would have never dreamed that their little bungalow in a modest neighborhood in Burlington, Ontario would sell for 2.2 someday but here we are 2.2 <laughs> not 3.2 yeah. so what do you like to do in your spare time in Moncton well I like to cheer for my favorite high school football team <laughs> my okay. sons my I have twin boys and uh and they're you know they play high school football and my husband coaches and that's really that's kind of our downtime that's our fun is hanging out of the field and uh and rolling with our families that that also are football families so that's, I love football. Yeah, that's my idea of a good time, you know, for like recreational purposes. But I run, I uh, do a lot of yoga, I work out, all that good stuff. All that good stuff. So 
uh, before you got into real estate in Toronto, uh, what did you do? Because most of us have always come from a different background and real estate quite often isn't our first gig. Well, I was 23 when I started studying for my real estate license. So I graduated from um, post-secondary and started my license, which was so young. Um, You are a rare breed. (laughs) My mother-in-law is still a realtor and in the GTA. And we were really inspired by her. My husband's also a realtor. Everybody's a realtor. My kids are going to be realtors. Um, (laughs) And so, you know, it it was just kind of, it was the right thing to do. And even though I had a job, uh, I worked in sales. I, this was my side hustle at first. I was so young. And I was like, well, even if I just sell a couple houses a year while I try to build up to making this my career. And then my husband got his license. He went full-time first um, when I was about 28. And then eventually we moved out east and we we both started making a living selling houses. What drew you to it? Um, well, me personally, I was it was everybody was doing. And I mean, my mother-in-law's doing it. My, you know, but we were, my You're husband just trying and I to fit in, right? Yeah. I just wanted my, I wanted my <laughs> in-laws to like me. Um, so <laughs> how could they not like, you? I, I, uh, <laughs> we also bought our first house. I was 23. So we were very young. We were investing in real estate already. We were at open houses all weekend, every weekend. It was just, it was how we were just spending our time anyway. And it was such an obvious next thing. It was sort we of got, a natural progression, it. right? It is. And, you know, you don't realize, like, I didn't grow up in a real estate family, but my husband did. And you do not realize what your kids absorb growing up in a real estate family. His mom and stepdad are both licensed realtors. So, you know, that's the dinner table. And it really hit me a couple of years ago. My boys would have been 13. Um, and, you know, one of them was like, we we're driving one day by the beach. And one of them's like, I wonder if that place has legal deeded access. And I heard the, the words come out of this kid, right? And I was like, this is this is it. It's like you have this inherent language and understanding that you don't realize. And it just starts to be what, what you do. And so my kids very much have that three generations deep. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how we wouldn't have become realtors. Yeah. Will you encourage your children to become real estate agents if they want to? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I want my boys to do whatever they want to do. Um, But it would be such a dream to all work together, right? So my husband and I work together. Um, We have a team, we have a local team. And I'll be honest, one of my biggest drivers in being so motivated to grow my business um, bigger than myself is I want to have a cool, awesome, positive environment for my kids to come to someday, should they choose to. And so that's the most motivating thing for me My in my big why is I want a, a business that if they want to come work here, it's going to be a really great place. Somewhere I'd be proud that they worked, you know? Yeah. yeah. So in 20 years, you must have a moment that was worst <laughs> moment. <laughs> I like to see, I like to start with the negative and then we yeah. move to the positive, but sometimes these stories can be really funny. So could you tell us that story and tell us what you learned from it? So Colin, what's great is how you send the questions to us in advance. And I was like trying to contextualize what you might mean by worst, right? I'm like, does he mean like funny worst or like worst worst? Um, <laughs> Whichever you want to share. <laughs> what there, it is, is, yeah. is that you you need to have learned something I've learned that you something. can share with other agents. I think that, um, you know, the collection of worst moments uh, often come from the part of the job. So I have a really public brand. I do a lot of content. Um, you know, I put myself out like I'm, I'm recognized in town. My family's that's, recognized that's in town. That's how you and I met. Right. So, so, yeah. and all of that, like, you know, I'm cool with, but one of the things that is hard to wrap my head around sometimes is that my phone number is in everybody's phone. Like people, strangers have my phone number and I'm working on, I purchased a digital number and I'm working on like weaning the public off my cell phone number, but we've got, it's like you, you know, you get going, you don't think it's going to get that big and you get it out there and now all these people have it. And so um, I'll get text inappropriate, like, like images, um, oh that can goodness. be pretty disturbing. Uh, I'll get, I get voicemails that are like just next level. So the worst of kind of the, the moments that are the worst are those like, so it was about a year ago on a Sunday morning, I'm sound asleep in bed. My phone goes off. 
I decide I'm going to check it and it's, you know, a DIC PIC and like, and, and from a complete, cause I sent out a mailer saying, Hey, I have a client looking for a home in your neighborhood. Right. And so those moments, like sometimes you just like, I can roll the punches pretty good, but every once in a while it'll be like a, just a little too close to home. And you're like, Oh geez. Like, and it's a, it's such a stark reminder of um, how vulnerable realtors are in this role, especially like women and yep. the position that you can find yourself in sometimes with people having access to all kinds of information about you, your whereabouts, that kind of stuff. And I always, you know, when you said worse, I was like, serious worse or funny worse. I think I'm going to go serious worse if I have the chance at all to just kind of like remind any women listening that um, it is paramount that you are making sure somebody knows where you are. Um, how to find you when you're going to be done and you're sharing your location with someone you trust. Because um, I found myself in a few situations every once in a while where I re- realized that like, you know, like I, if I wasn't taking safety precautions, I could be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. On our team, I don't know if, how it is on your team. Uh, we never meet anybody for the first time uh, at a property. Yeah. And there's always, if, if, for whatever reason, this you can't get around that. There's always two, and our open houses, there is always, always two, two people. Yeah, and there's like a, a lot of great, you know, like I have a safety app called Attack Alarm on my phone that I have open when I'm with somebody, um, and it's already programmed that if I, you know, if I activate it, it's going to send an audible alarm. It's going to text my geolocation to three people. Um, like I've got all of those types of things set up, and then I follow certain protocols. Like I never, I never park in a way that. Um, people could block me in the driveway, right? So I park on the street. Um, there's just like like little. Th- I when I'm showing a house, I never go in front. Like I, ne- I don't go into the basement first, right? I'm always between the exit and the person. Yeah. So there are certain like precautions to take that way. But I'm always reminded of that when I get kind of these random messages or uh, harassing like voicemails, things like that that come through, and it seems like a fairly common experience, honestly, for female agents. And so I think it's just an important thing to, to be cognizant of like, okay, like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm fine. Like, I'm not upset that someone's sending me like nine times out of 10, there's nothing wrong, but it's always important reminder that like real life happens too. And you need to yep. make sure you're safe. Can you repeat the name of that app that you have? Cause that's yeah, it's, important. It's Everybody called should attack have that. alarm. Yeah. Attack alarm. Attack alarm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And there's all kinds of all kinds of ways to do that, but um, in all kinds of apps. But I've been using that one for like over a decade, and came up with that protocol when I was selling only new construction. And so I'd find myself on job sites where you're not even on a street full of homes, right? You're like they're yeah. all new construction. You're in the only the only house, right? And and that's when I was really started to get um, hyper aware of this. So I'd find myself on job sites in these yeah, situations. In our area, it's rural property. So there so you you're go. going out to property that's sitting on 10, 20 acres. So yeah. there's nobody around. Right. Right. And you can be back way back on a logging road. Right. And you may have limited service in those, in those moments yeah. as well. So it's just really, you know, that's kind of the serious, the serious that I brought today, but it is um, pretty important that we're aware and cognizant of the ways that we can protect ourselves. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, everybody needs to not think that it won't happen to them. Yeah. Yes. Right? Agree. So agree. always be vigilant. So let's get out of this darkness here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you could give yourself uh, advice when you first started out, what would you say? Oh, I would. Um, I was. I was like a child. I mean, I was twenty three, but or twenty five yeah. when I got my license. But I would say, um, I would just to that girl. Period. I would want her to understand that she could just be herself like as soon as possible. And the more that you can be yourself, the more opportunity you give people who are, who are going to appreciate what's unique about you, the opportunity to find you. And that's what's so cool. So, you know, I just, I meet so many realtors that tell me all the time that they're like, Oh, it's so hard like to, to be different because everybody's trying to like fit the mold and follow the rules. And, if you watch realtors content, it's like, just listen, just sold, just listen. Like it's the same, the same, the same, the same. And it takes, you know, 
it takes courage to be yourself in this industry because not many people are. But wow, is it worth it when you allow people to see what's unique about you? So now they're hiring you based on what you're actually like and actually good at. And then once you're in a contract, you're not trying to fake it to keep up appearances with people who really maybe didn't value what's special about you in the first place. So be yourself, be yourself, be yourself. Yeah. Let's unbox that for a sec, because I think what you said is really, really important. And newer agents and some (laughs) veteran agents should pay heed to this is that you don't want to be looking like everybody else. The just listed, just sold is boring, lazy content that does not resonate with anybody. The just sold does prove that you're good at what you do and, you know, you do do, you know, some volume, but it doesn't make that personal connection with future clients, right? How do they get to know, like, and trust you? Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, you you make a point of it just sold, but at the same time, if you're in a seller's market, it doesn't actually tell anybody anything. Like, of course it's sold. And so I think it's just so disingenuous. I, one of the things that I I wish every realtor would ask before they hit post is who is this helping and how, and if the answer is it's helping me don't post it. That's so good. Like so much content from realtors is made for realtors. Like, and they don't even realize it. They're just posting it because they saw another realtor post it. And so now they're doing it. And it just turns into this weird competition of like showing off stuff that the public doesn't understand. And um, I'm very lucky. Like I have also a career in branding and my best friend is brilliant um, marketer as well. And this is all we talk about. And they're not in real estate. So they call me all the time and they'll be like, oh my gosh, this just happened. And this is what I think about real estate. And then we have these big, these these big conversations about how someone who's not a realtor is receiving the behavior of realtors. And they were telling me the other day in their neighborhood right now, um, everybody's putting on riders that instead of sold, it says, um, missed your chance. And they're, and they were like, why are you shaming me? Like I didn't even want to buy a house and now I feel like I did something wrong. Like I, you know what I mean? And I was like, it's so interesting how we can get so insulated and not put ourselves in the customer's shoes and and the public shoes. And we're already in an industry where like, let's be honest, we are in a housing crisis in this country. We have to be sensitive and, and aware of like the overall situation that's going on in Canada. And at the same time, you're putting out messaging where you're like, hey, like what, what are we doing? So if we can start thinking about the person on the other side of the content, you can serve them in a way that is actually helpful and useful and not just bragging and creating disconnection. And there's so many ways to do that. But, um, but most realtors are not most real estate content. I don't, I don't resonate with because it's just so, um, transactional and insensitive. Oh, I I fully agree. And I just call it lazy content. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They know they got to put something out. So they brag about themselves. Well, and if you're just checking a box, like people can feel that. So, you know, you said, how do you get people to know, like, and trust you? Well, you, you got to do something that you want them to know you. You have to show them who you are. Like you want them to like you, but you have to act like you like them. Like you want them to trust you, just be trustworthy. Like these are like, they're simple things. But if you're just checking a box and be like, oh, I got to post three times a day. Like people feel that. And you know, it's not, it's not any of the above. That what you just gave is just a real blueprint for everybody that everybody should think about twice before they hit that send button. Who am I serving? What value am I bringing by hitting send? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So let's go to the opposite of negative and go to the positive. We've all had the aha moment, the moment that clicked where it all made sense and you gained a sense of clarity. Tell us your aha moment, that moment that sticks with you and helps push you forward in your business. Um, I have this, like, I think everybody should be really clear on the client they serve best. And, you know, you probably have, you should, you probably have that client that like will fight people if they don't use you, right? Like I have this one client that if he hears that anybody's using anybody else, he gets emotional, like he's more upset than I am. Uh, You know, and he's out there and he is my, he's my sales force, this man. He's such a fan. But the aha comes from 
analyzing that transaction, when you think about who are those people in your business, right? So we've all had clients that by the time we're done working with them, maybe we don't even have any profit left. Like we've spent so much time and money and energy and whatever. And at the end, if you kind of tally all that up and you you count an hour, like the hours of your time and the value of your time, you actually lost money on the transaction. And then you have those clients that like, not only, you know, is it a profitable transaction, but it filled your bucket, like you feel good. And they're running around bringing you more clients that are just like them, right? So it's that second kind of client that you want to replicate. And I really landed mine last year in a really unique situation. And all I do now is try to find more people <laughs> just like them. But um, they came right from Instagram. And they came from Instagram after I, so I decided to start making more content in my, um, I have two Instagrams. One is um, my real estate team's Instagram and that's at meet me in Moncton. So a year ago, February, I decided I wanted, it was a new account. It was a small account for my team and I wanted to grow it as much as I could. So I started making daily reels, which was not a habit of mine until then. And you know, all February, make a reel a day and make a reel a day. Nothing happens. March, a reel a day. Nothing happens. April, a reel a day. Nothing happens. And you start like, I coach a lot of business owners and it's hard for people to keep going at that point. Right. And then on mother's day, I get this DM on Instagram and it was like, Hey, we have this house to sell. Um, we've watched every one of your videos and we'd like you to come and give us a price on our house. So I message back and I say, awesome. Are you available for a call right now? And they were like, yes. So I call and we have a great conversation and we set up an appointment and they had intended to interview three people, but the speed of reply superseded that. And they were really impressed and they thought, okay, well, like, let's just see where this goes. And so I walk into their house and it is maybe the, like, it's not the most extravagant house I've ever listed, but probably the most, well, definitely the most popular house I have ever listed. Um, and I walk into their house and he looks at me. So she's been following me for a couple of years. I don't know her. And he looks at me and he goes, I'm just going to tell you two things before we get started. I hate lawyers and I hate realtors. And I sit down and I'm like, that's amazing. I can't wait to change your mind. And we kind of chuckle. And, uh, we didn't sign the listing on the spot, but I walked away knowing that if they were going to sell their house, they're going to sell with me a yep. month later, you know, we listed the house, everything I told them would happen, happened. Every promise I made was kept. They valued that so much. They valued the precision, the data, everything, like all of the things about the way I work, they valued so much. And the reason they valued it so much was because they had spent hours watching my videos and I was exactly who I said I was. Like there was not, there was no surprise. I did not show up and look different. I did not show up and sound different. I did not show, nothing was different. It was, I said on all my videos, all these things. And they, by the time they messaged me, they're like, well, that's what we want. And so when I walk in and then I'm, all I have to do is just be the same person I was in the video. The selling was done. Now, these people, I calculated it recently for a presentation I was doing. That transaction alone, like that house brought, we had 11 offers on their house. We sold it significantly over asking because they did everything that I asked them to do. And um, I believe I've had six more deals. And I have to go back and check the numbers, but we've had six more deals in the last year from them or the house. And I have like five more clients on the go from that one transaction. Now, if you can go and find those people, your business explodes exponentially. But it came from being myself on social, unapologetically like showing up the way I do, and then just having to be myself when I walk in that meeting. That's it. Those two things just have to align. And it's so easy. So the aha for me was when I walked in and they knew, and this, listen, if I bump into them in town, They will quote the video I made that day. They watch every piece of content. And by contrast, you know, a few months before that, I had a client fire me and didn't like, liked nothing about my personality and sent an email and like, like was like, you know, I wish you were more like this person because they're nice and they're not you. Like it was, it was just like such a personal firing. And I realized that they met 
they met my buyer's agent in open house. They didn't know who I was. They never watched a piece of content. They did not interact with me at all. And then all of a sudden, at the end of their transaction, I show up to negotiate. They don't like anything about my energy. They don't like anything about the way that I am in the world. And I'm like, you know what? This is on us. We introduced me too late. And then we had a, and we wasted a lot of money and time on this. Now, if we had interjected video along the way, so that they could understand who Natalie is and whether that's what they wanted or not, they could have made that decision earlier. I much prefer that people opt out before they ever hire us than we find out at the end of the transaction that we weren't for them. That's that's so great. Our team, we do a lot on YouTube and we get people from there all the time. And when we show up, they act as if we have been friends for a while. Yes. Because we already have the no like, and trust from them watching us as well as all of our other socials and whatnot. And closing them is just natural progression. It's done. I started doing video marketing 2011, 2012, um, and, and using that as a big strategy when I was working for a new construction home builder. And I'm telling you, we had a series of five videos that we would get them to watch before we ever met in person. And it was, you know, just bringing them through the process and the videos feature myself, right? Because they're going to meet me. And by the time they would watch those five videos, at least, at least invested an hour of their time in watching those videos. By the time they walked into the model home, it was like, it's really you. (laughs) Like you have celebrity status, like it's done, but it's done. Like the relate, they already like you. Like the relationship is done. They trust you. You just have to not be fake. So as long as what they see in person replicates what they consumed in the comfort of their home, where they were the most comfortable and the most honest and the most themselves, if those two things align, you have brand integrity and, and you're good. Like trust is there. You can't break it. So, but that's really the trick is like, don't. What I see some people do is say, I'm going to start video and then try to look good on video. And there's no congruence to the, in like what you're going to experience in real life when you meet them. And so then you don't have brand integrity, which means you have distrust. So instead of saying, okay, the video was good. And then I met you in person and now I'm going to buy a house. The video was good. I met you in person and I'm like stranger danger. And I don't know why, but I can't trust you. Like, like neurobiologically, I cannot. And that's where we have. So when I say be yourself, like, like this is science. Like you, like you have to, or people just can't, they can't trust you. They can't connect. Yeah. Brand integrity, you know, being one person in one place and then showing up and being a different person. Yeah. In, in the subconscious stranger danger, right? Yes. Yeah. So important. So you've already opened up your toolbox, but I want you to open up your toolbox even further and share with our listeners, what are your marketing secrets and what has worked for you when you first started and what's working for you now? Because in 20 years, things have changed. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if I was first starting now and, you know, when I first started, what was key was getting out, (laughs) getting out in person and networking, like going to I mean, everything, going to every possible networking event, going to your chamber of commerce events, um, going to anything you can in your community where people are gathering and you will start to see the same faces and recognize the same people. Go to those events, um, not to just hand your business card out, but to actually have conversations, give value, go with a goal. If you're nervous when you're interacting with people, go with a goal to speak to a certain amount of people. Um, But what's going to happen is you're going to be able to start building familiarity with people. And then over time, when people are used to that and they feel good in your presence, when they see your content, they're going to be like, oh, that's, that's her. So initially, you want to get out and meet as many people as possible. In my opinion, if you're running a local real estate business, that means getting out like physically in your, in your vicinity. And then once you've kind of got a good saturation of that, which I, I do in our market, then you can leverage that on social. And so I talk a lot um, when I kind of teach this stuff about growing on social to a new audience is amazing. However, where the magic is, people always say like, what's your greatest lead source? And it's always repeat and referral. Um, So it's either past clients or friends of clients. And the reason that is such a big source for me is because I make so much content. So my content's not necessarily like 
brand new cold traffic, although that does happen. But what it really does is keeps me top of mind with people who've had a good experience in the past, and then they don't think of anybody else. And that's what is just like for lead gen, that is what crushes. Now for marketing properties, I've got a whole other toolbox, but for lead gen, it's really understanding that social's job is to keep you close to the people who know you. And if you can think of it that way, you're going to show up as yourself a lot more than if you're assuming you're talking to a cold audience all the time. Yeah. Yep. Top of the funnel versus bottom of the funnel, right? Yeah. 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 So you, you have two kids and we all know that success doesn't come easy. For most of us, we sacrifice the time for success. How do you keep a work-life balance? What advice could you share? I don't. I don't. I think it's it's um, a fallacy that people say to make people feel, especially women, feel guilty. Like, I hate, I hate it. Sorry. Um, nope. I hate it. I, I do. I think it's so foolish because we don't talk about it as much for dads. We don't, yeah. it's not as interesting for dads. It's very interesting to hear how moms do it. And that just makes me crazy. So um, my husband and I are both realtors. I definitely work an, an obscene amount of hours because I love to work. And so what I've raised my children to understand is that it's okay that mom loves to work. Like that's not, that does not reflect anything about your worth as a human. And so my children were raised that, first of all, I picked them up at school every single day to this day we i still pick them up there's no need they they're in high school there's no need but it's our time um i drop them off in the morning literally no need for it but it's our time we have we've always had pick up and drop off in the middle of the day no matter what was going on we have that special time and we i protect that fiercely so we have that we have um like sports, like you asked me what my hobby is and what my kids' football career, like, like these, like we are able to talk about having goals and dreams and supporting each other and going all in. My kids train like crazy, um, you know, and we don't let anybody, nobody feels in this family like they're entitled to anybody else's time. We give our time as a gift but we don't demand each other's. And I think that's been, I like, I know a lot of people would say I'm wrong, but man, it works for us. Like we, we like spending time together. We enjoy each other. So I don't like the idea of expectations um, or duty of giving, like uh, of, of owning each other's time. But I love the idea of giving time as a gift. And when you think of it that way, and we learn it that way. It works really well. So my kids always know, like they know that they're home, the doors open, the door shut. Um, you know, we run, we have two Wi-Fi's so that we don't fight over internet speed. Like we have some things like that 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 work. But um, we've always, I've always worked a lot of hours because I love to, and I don't subscribe to the idea that there's a right way to do it or that I'm a bad mom because I like to work a lot. Yeah, and yeah. I, I want to touch. That's really, really good. I don't believe in work-life balance either. I believe you have uh, things to get done to serve your client and you do them and then you find time otherwise. On the flip side of that, I had a conversation with a, uh, with a gentleman and he picks up his kids every day, but he finds pushback when he has to leave the office and say, I'm going to go pick up the kids because that's not, you know, in our society, something that guys normally do. And he feels guilt for leaving his team to pick up his kids. Yeah. And I people, he feels people are like, oh, I, I guess your career is not that important kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. Thing, yeah. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so there's, a, there's a flip side to that as well. And he totally. is very much like you in the term that he's like, I get half hour with my kids in the car and we chat and we talk and I take them home and then I go back to work or he goes and works in his home office, but he still puts in the time yeah. and it's the societal pressure on men that we can't have the taking care of the kids and the family life. So it's sort yes. of on the other side of that as well. Totally agree. Totally see it with my husband. To like, yes, yes, yes. 
And as important as it is for me to say what I just said about moms, it's so important that he continues to do this unapologetically and show other people the way. Oftentimes when people have things to say about the way that you work, it's because they're jealous that they're not doing that thing. I mean, really, like who's who's doing more than you that's complaining about what you're doing? Like anybody who's doing more than you, accomplishing um, more than you, achieving more than you, they're not looking back and like making fun of you for picking your kids up. Those those people are not, right? The people complaining about what you're doing are the people who are jealous that you're accomplishing something they're not. Yep. And so- The people behind you that you shouldn't be paying any attention to. No, no attention, but you should be thinking about those moms coming behind you that want to see somebody do it differently or those dads coming behind you that want to see somebody doing differently. They need to see that. Yeah. Because people are going to give them trouble. And so all of a sudden, if they have a model of someone who came before them and did it the way they want to do it, they now see that the path is is there and they can do it too. So to me, like I'll give props to um business coach I had a few years ago, Rachel Rogers, and she talked, she she taught so much about she's not a real estate coach, but she's a business coach and she taught about boundaries with your kids. And she, how she taught her kids that mommy works, mommy likes to work and her kids were little. And she was like, when that door shut, that's like, I'm, I don't belong to you. And that was just such a refreshing approach. Like the kids were fed. They had, you know, they had supervision they had lots to do, whatever. Like, like all of that was there. And they weren't it, left to go feral. No, like, you know, and, and it was such an interesting exercise. And she said to her, like, for her, it was so important to teach her daughters this model. And yes, and I'm really excited that I've taught my sons. Like, I've taught my sons that their mom can do this. And like, I'm not out of control with work. I move my body for 45 minutes every day. People say to me all the time, how do you take time for yourself every day to work out, right? Like, if it's really astonishing the mindset around time because my, like my schedule doesn't own me. I, I definitely own my schedule. Um, and if you asked anybody who follows me a lot, you would have people say, Oh yeah, she's always out for walks. She like, I'm sure those people think I never work. I have a guy that jokes all the time. He's like, you ever work? All you're doing is going for walks, going to yoga. I'm like, do I ever work? Like, yeah. you know, like it, it's like, you gotta, you gotta understand that you're only here for so long and you gotta spend the time doing things that light you up. And if you're lucky enough to find a career that does that, and I think everybody should not stop until they find a career that does that, then why would you go and do like, not do spend your time doing it? So I work a lot. I work out a lot. I hang out with friends a lot. I hang out with my kids a lot and all of those, and my, my husband and all of those things make me super happy. Yeah, I think you get to a point in your career or in your life and you just start thinking, you know, why don't I do more stuff that makes me happy? You know, yeah. like, wh what am I doing here? You know, like yeah. I used to think in my head that I had to be in my office and I had to be working because that's what society said that I had to do in order to be perceived as being successful. And I was like, why am I doing this? You know, like I got a cell phone. Why don't I go to the gym? I can answer any calls. I can text people back, but I'm at the gym and I'm having a good time and I'm taking care of myself. I am when we finish this call. So right now in my town, it's 5 30 PM. When we finish this call, I'm going for my run. And then for you. from my car, I'm going to do an offer presentation for, you know, like, if, like we, cause my client is available at that time. And so I could stay home and wait, or I could use the technology I have to, to make this work for me. And I'm 100% going to do that. And do you know, I have never had a client complain that they had to talk to me from my car. Never once. Like, you know, you just make it work. I, I remember um, when I first got into real estate and one of my mentors at the time, the great Ken Goss, who unfortunately passed away last year, he said to me, he said, real estate is not a job. Or a career, it's a lifestyle. and You make it work. Yeah. So what is the one thing that has you most excited about the future of your real estate business? Of my real estate business? Well, um, you're at EXP, right? I certainly am. Yeah. So I moved to EXP last month. And oh, last month. Yeah. Yeah. I've been there for exactly four weeks, I think. Um, 
and I'm in Go Go Bethke's organization. And I was so shocked that I was already like a top recruiter last month. So um, I have a whole new I have a whole new world that just opened up to me coming to EXP. And um, what's really the world's a different color over here. Like I won't lie. Like I I everybody would talk about it, and I was like, sure, like sure, it's that great. Um, but wow, everything is. It's really spectacular. I won't lie. The, <laughs> the energy, the collaboration, the attitude is, is different than I have seen in the industry. And then the, the doors that are opening are just wild. So, yeah. yeah. I, I try on this podcast to be very um, agnostic about brokerages. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a surprise for you who my guest is tomorrow morning. Who is it? Go, go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've known Go Go for a while now, so that's I was, amazing. Yeah, I was one of the original people in British Columbia to join uh, EXP. I was there day one, okay. and uh, we really launched in all of Canada. I've been six years now, I guess. Wow. Yeah, and I agree with you, and I won't go on too much about it because people yeah. hate when we vomit EXP yeah, yeah, yeah. on they, everybody. Like, until you're here, it's hard to believe that it's true. It, it It is a different color, and I just, for the past six years, I've just been <laughs> happier than I ever have been, yeah. right? So yeah. anyways. Yeah, so, so I'm excited about, for my real <laughs> estate excited. business, I'm excited about this. I'm yeah. excited about... Um, just like a real a real mindset shift in so many ways in the industry and like you know i've worked in so many different places in the industry like i've worked in new construction um my husband opened a boutique brokerage and you know that was just like two or three realtors like i mean we've been big brokers like we've done it we've done the gamut right yeah. and i would when people say it's a different way of looking at the business like there's no i didn't even when i said yes, and moved. I didn't even get it. And it's like every day it becomes clearer and clearer. So I feel, um, I feel equipped for changes that are going to hit in the industry, regardless, like whether it's regulatory or whatever, I do feel like I'm moving in alignment with a group of people who are able to handle change. And that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, the the big thing for me that I never saw was the collaboration. So yeah. it, yes. it's unbelievable how well connected I am to a lot more people. I live in a small northern town, and um, I'm collaborating with, collaborating with people in San Diego and uh, you know Nashville, and and we get together and we talk about best practices and where our businesses are and whatnot, and it, it, we just elevate everybody. But exactly, again, yes. we, we won't beat this one. To death, but <laughs> so give our listeners three actionable takeaways that you think every agent should be doing in their business right now. Uh huh. I think every agent in their business, first of all, should be posting content every single day on Instagram. Like, like no excuses every now, day. Instagram is your weapon of choice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I do. Why is that? Uh, Instagram has the best messaging platform for sales for sure. And so if you want to get into the DMS and build a relationship with somebody, that's where you do it. Right. So people trust Instagram you and me. a lot. You, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and you know, and you honestly have a pretty good propensity to go viral. Like I've, I, I was an early adopter on TikTok, and you know, it was really easy to get viral on TikTok back then. And like, I, I had a couple of, of big ones. I grew an audience fairly quickly and it was like not a great feeling audience. Like I won't lie. TikTok's one of those places where you go make content and like you, like their algorithm serves your content to people who will love you and also to people who won't. Like they, they don't mind if it's polarizing, right? They don't mind if, so in my opinion, that's how their algorithm works on Instagram. The algorithm is much more like, um, healthy. Like it, it's serving content, at least to people who want to interact with the content and who are po more positive about it. So of course, I'm not saying like they're the poster child for health, but I do think you're going to have a better user experience on Instagram. And I think one of the things, well, I know that one of the things I hear about when I'm coaching realtors and other small business owners is they find social media can be tough on their mental health. And so Instagram is a place I, I find is probably the best for that. So you should be posting on Instagram every day. If you ask me, um, 
I would love to see more realtors really embracing the power of the open house and uh, just like leveraging that to the next level. It's the second biggest driver of second, third biggest driver of leads in my business. And we do not mess around. My team had eight open houses last weekend. Um, and we, we just take those to the next level. They also give, give our listeners uh, some points. Yeah. I mean, so, okay. I'm going to give you a couple, I'll give you a couple things before we have an open house. We mail uh, the entire, this is Tom on my team. We mail the entire neighborhood, the whole postal code. And we have a QR code on the back. We have these in bulk so that we don't have to print them every time we have a new listing. And it says your neighbor as listing the house for sale, you should be the first to know. And you go here, it drives to our website. On our website, there will be a listing for that house and the open house dates. So we are trying to drive as much traffic as possible to the open house to create a feeling of like <laughs> scarcity and intensity around that. We, I do want nosy neighbors in for many, many reasons, right? Yep. We get lots of listing appointments after people see our open house strategy. We'll do open house um, unless it's dark on at night. So in the winter seasons, we don't. We do open houses Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, every weekend and um, on new listings. All, all three days. All three days. All three days. In, in the evenings or just Friday, Friday night, night from then... six to eight, Saturday from two to four, Sunday from two to four. And sometimes we will do doubles on Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And I will tell you, the majority of people who come in have a realtor. So we're not doing yep. a lot of dual agency because of this. Like they think people think that's why we do it. That's not why we do it. We want to show the features of the home. We want to show the features of the home. And, and we don't want to just trust that anybody off the street is, and I know a realtor, it's not just anybody off the street, but like, we don't want to trust that a realtor who maybe isn't so experienced is going to find all of the the best things about the home. We want to show the home. So um, ultimately you can show it during regular showing hours, but what we find is the majority of people, we don't get that many showings outside of open houses. A lot of realtors have learned to trust our team, send their clients to our open houses we have in our sign-in sheet, we have, do you have a realtor? Yes. Cool. Who is it? We take their name so we can contact them and say, hey, your client came to our open house. Um, offers are due on Tuesday. We drive this process so that we can sell the features of the house. And it's such a benefit to homeowners because, you know, it it, it works. Like it absolutely works. We had offers, multiple offers two weekends ago on a listing um, that wasn't even new to market because they came to the open house. They both had realtors. And one of them had decided not to offer came back to the open house, changed their mind, came back with an offer. So these, th like, you can't replace standing in the product with a bunch of people and somebody who's really fired up and passionate about that home. And that's what our team brings. So uh, I'm, I'm only on point two. Oh my gosh, I talk so much. So <laughs> post okay. every day, open house strategy. the value strategy. you're bringing. And then when the neighbors come in, here's a, here's a trick. When the neighbors come in and you find that it's a neighbor, you ask the following two questions. Are you here to choose a neighbor or find out what your home is worth? Because they're there for one of those reasons. So and good. if they answer the second question, you're going to do a CMA. Yeah, you're going to book next, the appointment. In the next few hours, yeah, you're going to get a yeah. CMA in their hands as fast as possible. Yeah, I, I love that. So number three thing. Oh, I th okay, sorry. Everybody I thought should. that I was going to give that for three. Um, oh, number hey, that's pretty good. But let's lay, lay out another one here. Number three is um, I wish more realtors were automating their communications so they could be a lot more thoughtful about how they follow up. And, and that's really like, that's key. So even come back to my open house strategy, somebody who doesn't have a realtor immediately goes into a drip campaign that's pre-written and the first message goes out the day they visited the open house and it's like hey thanks for coming to the open house today just a reminder offers are due tuesday at noon um should you want to put an offer in you know here's here you should probably have that information to me by monday but if you'd like to see it again before that time we can book a private showing then there's an automated message that follows up on Monday and says, Hey, just a reminder, if you were going to offer, we'd like to see your stuff in the next kind of three hours, like, you know, whatever your offers, the contents of your offer. And then, um, after offer day, like, Hey, we understand this one wasn't for you. If you'd like to see other properties in the neighborhood, we'd love to show you. We have a couple in mind. Let me know. And like, there's a, there's a bunch of follow-ups yep. that gets me more listing appointments as well. Oof. That's, that's powerful right there. Mm -hmm. Somebody should take 
notes here. So realtors are generally recorded. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's good. You can come back and listen to it over and over again. Mm -hmm. Realtors are generally a giving bunch. What are you doing to give back to your community? Well, I mean, I like I like to like financially give back to youth sports here and there, um, depending on need. So I keep an eye real close to a few um, a few organizations. But in terms of like more strategic, I have a monthly event. So our team is Meet Me in Moncton, and uh, I love that. Did, by the way, it's so thank catchy. you. And we did a YouTube show last year called Meet Me in Moncton, where it was like a live studio audience, and we would bring in an entrepreneur, somebody from a nonprofit in town, and really created this big buzz around that. And that turned into our monthly Meet Me in Moncton experiences. And so what I love there is we find a local business that wants to get more people in their doors. And that's a real passion of mine is shopping local and supporting local business, especially in this economy. Big time. So um, so we host these meetups at local businesses that are so much fun. And so whether it's, you know, the yoga studio, um, we have one Wednesday night coming up at a business called the Good Eye Thrift Shop. And, you know, it's it's a small business, a wonderful woman that runs that business. So I have been promoting an event. I'm filling up an event, right? I'm bringing a whole group of people that have never been there before. And we're like, she's shutting down and it's a meet me in month and night. And so it's not like... Um, you know, if you're looking for financial give back, I do that financially in youth sports, but strategically, like this is a really fun way because then I'm blasting out this business all over my social channels, even if people can't come. But like, do you know how cool it is? I'm constantly hearing people be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, so, I'm enrolled at Crave Rowing now because I went to meet me in Moncton or like whatever. Like I hear all the time or I'll go to the, I went to my yoga studio the other night and there's people there because they came to my event in January. And now they're members and like that stuff, like the connections, but then like also seeing them become customers. And, yeah. and that is like, mm, that's my. Be- being the connector in your community is so powerful. It's more powerful than giving money to a charity is to be able to connect people and have them be able to do that value exchange between each other. A hundred percent. And it, and it amplifies, right? So like, yes, I can make one donation or I can make a donation and I can start to like, I can feature that person um, who runs that charity on my show and we can make sure lots of people know about them. And we can like, so I feel like giving back has different facets. So yes, there's the financial piece, but also there's the visibility and visibility is kind of my jam. And if you think back to the very beginning of this conversation, when you said, what would you do if you started? And I said, I'd go to all these events, right? And now I'm hosting these events. And so I'm not seeing a lot of like junior realtors coming to the, and I'm like, why aren't you here? Like, sure. I'm a realtor, but like get here, come to the events, like meet the, meet the people. And you know, go, go to the shopping night, go to the rowing class, like get in groups of people who, if people are going to a networking event, they're essentially in a nonverbal way saying, I want to meet people. Like those are the people to go meet. So yeah, it's kind of a full circle, but right back to that again. I, I, I love it. I love everything that you said. So how we usually close this out is that we do a rapid fire round, which is my absolute favorite. So are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I didn't read this part either. So it's going to be really actual rapid fire. (laughs) Okay. What is the one piece of technology that you can't do without and you can't say your cell phone or MLS? Um, Geez, uh, I should have probably checked. Um, I mean, my MacBook and I would never, ever consider a PC. Book it is. (laughs) What is the best book you've ever read? The best book I've ever read has to be uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Absolute classic. What is the best business advice you've ever received? Great marketing could be the fastest way to ruin your business. (laughs) (laughs) Now, this is a favorite of mine. Imagine you woke up tomorrow morning in a brand new world, identical to Earth, but you knew no one. You still have all the experience and knowledge you currently have, your food and shelter is taken care of, but all you have is your MacBook and five hundred dollars. What would you do to resurrect your real estate business in the next seven days? Ooh, um, if I only had seven days, I would run Facebook ads with five hundred dollars for sure. If I had five hundred dollars in seven days, is that like you pay for speed, right? 
So I would be running targeted Facebook ads in my market and I would be telling this exact story in my Facebook ads. I would be, it would be a, a real style video and it would be my face and I would wear a bright color shirt and because I already own it and it didn't cost me money to buy it. And I would say, you aren't going to believe this, but I lost everything and I have $500 and seven days to resurrect my, like I would tell the story of what I was experiencing and then bring it home as to why that was going to uh, be like, I would tell the truth. Yeah. I would just tell the truth. I would make a video telling the truth. So authentically yourself and document the journey. Like today, somebody asked me for it. They were like, Oh, uh, I know this kid that just graduated from school for digital marketing. He's trying to get a job. What should he do? And I was like, what he should do is make an Instagram account called Alex learns digital marketing or Alex gets a job and then document the journey and show his digital marketing skills of trying to get a job. And then guess what? He's going to get a job, right? So if you document the journey, you tell the truth, like, you know, if you're a 19 year old realtor, talk about how you're a 19 year old realtor, like make that the best thing about you. That's what I would do. Yeah. People connect with that last one. And then we will say goodbye. Give us a quote that has guided you in your life. Okay. I'm going to say it wrong, but, uh, Brene Brown on a podcast one time, it wasn't like at one of her like epic quotes, but it was a podcast interview. And I heard her say this and it changed my whole life. Common enemy intimacy is not belonging. So we think sometimes because we have a common enemy, we belong together, but belonging is where you can be your whole true self. And so if you just have a common enemy with someone, that doesn't mean you're being your whole true self. And that quote changed my life because I noticed all of these situations where I had common enemy and intimacy and I thought I had belonging. That's good. That's really deep. Has, has me thinking now. So, Brene. <laughs> Brene. So one of the big things we like to do on this podcast is myself, like you, we'd love referrals. Okay. If another agent has somebody coming in or out of Moncton and they want to get a hold of you, what is the best way that they can get a hold of you? No naughty photos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no naughty photos. Do not send Natalie no, naughty photos, do not do please. Um, imagine. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously Instagram DM as discussed, um, uh, at meet me in Moncton, um, uh, website, meet me in Moncton, Google Natalie Davison. I mean, all of the, everything is out there all over the internet. My phone number is everywhere. So, um, it should not be hard to find me, but you can definitely, definitely, um, DM me on any social platform and we are on it all over it. Amazing. So thank you very much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. You drop nothing but value Thank you. for a whole entire hour. And I myself, I'm going to go back and listen to this and take notes. And I'm going to be hitting you up on the DM when I have questions. Hit me up on the DM anytime. <laughs> okay. Thank you so very much. And we will talk very, very soon. Thank you so much for listening to Total Agent Access. Head on over to iTunes, hit subscribe. While you're there, leave us a review. One star is okay, but five stars is even better.